Brazil Seahawks are coming upon the dark forces of the Sith in order to solve their defensive struggles. Will it work? When Coach Carroll first arrived in Seattle in 2010, he brought a defensive methodology that he had spent decades workshopping and tinkering with in order to find just the right order of dominance. He first learned the defense at the foot of Bud Grant in Minnesota, and then further refined it from there and stops at San Francisco and two brief head coaching stints with the Patriots and the Jets. But it wasn't until he got to USC that Coach Carroll was able to strike that right sort of balance, the secret sauce, if you will, and take that college program from its lowest of lows to its highest of highs. By the time it got into Seattle, Coach Carroll's defensive philosophy was a knife so well honed, you could have cut steel with it. It was a defense first and foremost that was obsessed with stopping the run and limiting the big play. From there, it would play a predominant amount of zone coverage and a certain type of zone coverage at that. It was a defense that did not want to blitz if but ever. This, of course, was then going to put a ton of pressure on the front four to generate the pass rush all on their own. Carroll's piece de resistance was the addition of two giant cornerbacks in his starting unit, guys well over six feet tall. This was at a time in the NFL when there were many teams that didn't even have a six-foot cornerback on the roster, much less two of them starting. In some NFL circles, Carroll's defensive approach was met with disbelief, snickering, finger-pointing. They viewed his defense as something out of the 1980s, a college defense that would quickly get turned to Swiss cheese the second it got matched up against the 4D chess NFL offenses of the modern era. Well, Coach Carroll, of course, shut these naysayers up right quick, didn't he? He and John Schneider had an epic three-year run of drafts that is as good as any we've seen in NFL history. They were able to stack up elite defensive talent across the board on that side of the ball, which helped them go on to dominate DVOA for four straight years, which has never been done. DVOA is an advanced defensive metric that better calculates team performance. But in addition to this, they had running backs pissing their pants. Quarterbacks running for the mama. Even offensive linemen scared to death. In part, thanks to this dominant defense, the Seahawks were able to go to back-to-back -back Super Bowls and even win one. So what the fuck happened? First, the defensive talent started to drain away. Guys got older, more injured, more expensive. Some guys even had to retire prematurely due to injury. Then on the other side of it, Coach Carroll and John Snyder seemed to have lost that drafting magic that had been so divine before. They were unable to replenish the talent base lost. And finally, teams had begun to solve the once impenetrable cover three scheme. Coach Carroll at this time did seem to recognize this and tried some half measure adjustments. Moral of the story is, I chose a half measure when I should have gone all the way. Coach Carroll fired recently hired defensive coordinator Chris Richard and replaced him with former linebackers coach Ken Norton, but there were actually very few schematic adjustments made. It was also right around this time that the Los Angeles Rams were bringing in a very young, bright, offensive mind with the sole purpose, it would seem, of knocking our mighty Hawks from their perch. Well, how has he done it? How has Sean McVay, like Van Helsing, been able to come into the Seahawk lair and drive a stake through the heart of the Cover 3 defense? Let's go down the film room and take a look. We're going to take a look now at how Sean McVay has gone after our Seahawks over his span there in L.A., not only when he first walked into the door, but even up till this past season. For his approach hasn't necessarily been all that much varied. He's utilized a main tactic at the head of this, and that is the flood zone concept. 
Now, I will acknowledge there has been other ways that this Ram offense has attacked our Seahawk defense and found success. But for my money, the spearhead end to this particular stick is the flood zone concepts. So I'm not going to concern myself with the blunt end that will occasionally go up my head when I keep getting stabbed over and over and over again with the sharp end of the stick. And the sharp end of the stick, this flood zone concept, is really not all that complicated. In basic layman terms, what it is is you're going to take an offensive player, a receiver predominantly, you're going to have that receiver run through a defender's zone, and this is an offensive principle that mainly attacks zone-based defenses. So this first player runs that into that defensive player's zone, that defensive player picks him up in coverage, and then continues to carry him up in coverage even at the loss of leaving his zone. This happens often because a player is just going to have a very hard time first picking up a player in coverage and then releasing him to come back for another player coming back into his zone. So what happens is your first defender leaves the zone, then the second offensive player comes into the zone that's been vacated, and he tends to be wide open. All right, I'm going to have to break this up into slow motion slash somewhat stills in order to show you this because, of course, YouTube has got pretty good hard rules on showing any just pure footage from game film. But I think you'll still get the overall point. And again, these are all going to be clips that are going to be showing this flood zone concept at play, attacking the Seahawk defense. Now, what you have to understand about how the Rams are looking at this is that they understand within their attack that the Seahawks corners, a predominant amount of this time, are going to be dropping into their cover three bail technique. This essentially means the corners will be in off coverage, and then they will be going backwards at the snap. This is something they can understand offensively right from the jump. So here you have trips to the high end of your screen. That's two wide receivers and a tight end all stacked together. We're going to see a lot of this, not necessarily trips, but guys stacked together, receivers stacked together in order to confuse our zones. Here on the other side of the screen, you've got Bradley McDougal at the top of the screen, Bobby Wagner next to him, and then our corner on the high side here. Now, the Rams know this corner is going to be dropping into bail technique, going backwards. They know there's probably a good chance that Bradley McDougal is going to be doing the same thing. And this leaves Bobby Wagner in a bit of a pickle because you'll have the first receiver run the corner deep. You'll have the second receiver come and run Bobby Wagner deep on a bit of a post route slash nine route here. This leaves then the third wide receiver being Cooper Cup, the last man out the building wide open if Bradley McDougal's not going to come up or Barkevious Mingo isn't picking up the middle zone. And indeed, that's not what's happening here. Mingo goes to the flat. McDougal goes to his cover three responsibility. And this is going to leave Cooper Cup wide open open. A little bit of a different look. You've got Richard Sherman up in press coverage at the top of the screen, Trey Flowers in press coverage at the bottom of your screen, and then you've got your safeties on the outside of the outside wide receivers. Now, again, the Rams understand that, that the Seahawks are going to run cover three with the outside, essentially what is the outside corner in a given situation. So in this given situation, you have Sherman almost playing a de facto inside slot position by how he's aligned leaving Leno Hill as that outside de facto corner, even though Leno Hill is actually a safety. And what you're going to see here is that even though he's playing five, six, seven yards off ball here, Leno Hill is still going to take an additional one, two, three steps backwards at the snap. Why is he doing that on a third and three play when you're trying to stop this Rams offense from getting a first down, when you're trying to, at this point in time, hold on for this win in this football game? Well, because he has in this defense over and over again, the same scheme being played, the same play being played where he needs to play to that cover three responsibility as that outside corner. So he's taking a couple of those false bad steps because that's what the scheme is telling him to do. Now, Leno reacts and tries to drive then on the route, but this is a simple underneath route being run. It's a quick in route. It's not a long developing route. And since Sherman was already run out of the zone completely off of the inside receiver, that means that the route is wide open. And not only are you going to see this effective here in 2018, you're going to see it here soon also effective in 2021. On this play, we're going to concentrate on the two Rams wide receivers running up the middle of the football field. It's funny, this used to be a faux pas back in the olden days of football, having two wide receivers running through the same zone. It would have been thought that surely one of them was running the wrong route. But indeed, no one here is running the wrong route. This is all completely purposeful. And what you're going to notice here is the Rams are very aware 
pre-snap to post-snap that the Seahawks are going to run cover three. And as you can see, that's exactly what the Seahawks run. You've got your two corners on the outside already dropping back and your center field safety also in his back pedal. Now, the Seahawks still would seemingly have at least a numbers game to somewhat fit to this matchup with McDougal, Wagner, and Justin Coleman as your three defenders against the three, def three offensive players at the bottom of your screen running their routes. But instead, Coleman is going to drop into the flat Bobby's going to then go pick up Todd Gurley, and this is going to leave Bradley McDougal out on an island by himself trying to pick up two on one, and we know that's just not going to work. A couple frames further, and that's just what we see. The Rams know, as you can see with Shaquille, he's going to be running into his deep zone to go cover nobody. This is going to then have Robert Woods running McDougal off, and that's going to leave Brandon Cooks wide open since Bobby Wagner is going to jump the route underneath. 15-yard gain. Easy as pie. The deep crosser on the back of a nine route is one of the main focal points of the flood zone principle and how it concerns how the Rams have attacked the Seahawks specifically. And this isn't overtly complicated, it's just effective. And what you're going to have here is the Rams are around midfield. It's first and 10. Seahawks are obviously going to be playing the run because it's early down. Rams understand this. The Rams also understand that because of that, there's a high likelihood that the Seahawks are playing their cover three look on the back end of things. Indeed, that's what they're showing pre-snap with their corners and off coverage. You don't even see the safety in the view of the camera, which definitely means he's back in his center field duties. And the Rams then are going to attack this. Brandon Cooks is the first guy. He is your point man. He's going to run the go route there at the bottom of the screen, which is then going to take Trey Flowers out of the picture. Then Cooper Cup at the top of your screen is going to come around on a crosser to that side of the field. Cup is able to do this because, of course, the corner at the top of the screen is playing zone to the deep end of the field. Cup is essentially running away from the zone responsibility of the corner who would be his natural cover man on the play. This leaves this wide open, a big play, and this is, again, very concerning because much like the last play we saw, you have a defense that's built in its principles, in its tenants to stop the big play, and yet that is just what it's doing. We now get to this last year, 2021. Certainly, our CR coaching staff by this point has figured it out, right? Certainly, they have some new wrinkles in order to deal with this Rams offense. Well, not on these particular plays I'm going to show you. And what you see here right from the jump, if your eyes look to the bottom side of the screen, you've got Cooper Cup in the slot, Nodell Beckham on the outside, and Ugo Amadi is the only man lined up across from them. Now, he's not alone. We do have Sidney Jones about six, seven yards off ball at this point. But we know that there's a good likelihood that Sidney Jones is going to be playing again into that cover three technique, right? He's going to be dropping into that deep zone. And indeed, that is what he does. So this puts Ugo in quite a predicament because he's got two really fine wide receivers there and there's only one of him. And even he sometimes can struggle. So he's got to either go take Cup or take Odell. He takes Cup. This leaves Odell wide open. Stafford is well aware of what's playing out here because he can see Sidney in off coverage pre-snap. Easy completion, no problem. Coach Carroll and Ken Norton did try some minor alternative approaches during this time period. For instance, in 2019, they both seemed to have come to an agreement prior to the year that they were going to run 4-3 base defense at nearly double the rate of anybody else in the entire NFL. This led to linebackers getting smoked in coverage by wide receivers, Michael Kendricks leading the league in missed tackles, and the defense continuing to devolve. In 2020, with the addition of Jamal Adams, the team decided that the solution to their answers would be blitzing at a league-high rate. This was after spending years actively avoiding the practice. When that predictably failed, Coach Carroll and Ken Norton went to their final refuge, that being the cover two defense. Let's go down back into the film room and see how that worked out. When Ken Norton arrived as the defensive coordinator in 2018, the Seahawks were still running primarily their same coverages on the back end. Here you can see again pre-snap, your corners drop to the outside third of the field. Earl Thomas drops to the center field there to make sure that the offenses can't take the top of the defense off. And this is what you would get play in and play out. Here it is post-snap, light green boxes being your two outside corners. 
Earl Thomas being there in the middle, your center field safety. And then the four dark purple boxes being, of course, your three linebackers and Cam Chancellor there in his lurking a role there going towards the flat to take that away. Outside of running a 4-3 base defense for almost a year straight solid or trying to trade for Jamal Adams and then turning into a blitz-heavy team, Norton was also trying a couple of other slight modifications within the defense here. And the main change that was occurring during this time period and really took hold right about the 2020 season and then really even took firmer hold this past year in 2021 was the Tampa Bay 2 defense, uh, the cover 2 defense. And what this is is a defense that was born out of Tony Dungy's mind when he was back there with the Buccaneers in two, 2000s. Now, the Buccaneers went on to win a Super Bowl with Gruden. Instead of Dungy, he had moved on, but the components of his defense were still there. And it has carried forward onto the NFL even to this day because it can still find some slight effectiveness when run right. And the defense basically has a lot of similarities back to what you would see with the cover three. You can see that you have a lot of guys dropping into zone coverage. You can see it's protecting mainly against the big play at maybe the cost of giving up some of the short stuff or any of the stuff that might be a little bit behind the line of scrimmage. And that's okay by this defense. The other thing that it allows is as far as a difference to what the Seahawks defense was running prior is instead of having one safety having to guard that deep center field, now you got two. You sort of end up splitting the center field in half. The corners underneath are going to tend to run a little bit of a trail technique on the receivers in the hopes that you're able to then bracket that receiver between the cornerback and the safety. And if those wide receivers should instead to then run, let's say, a slant route or drag route underneath, you've got the linebackers, specifically the outside linebackers, sitting ready there to take away those routes. What's also interesting here is that the deep Middle field is then taken over by the middle linebacker. In this case, you're running somewhere upwards of sometimes 15, 20 yards up the field to take away those seam routes. So it's a defense that does have some effectiveness at times, but unfortunately for our Seahawks, they were not very effective in running it. And there are a couple of reasons for this. First off, you can see on this particular slide, you have Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs as though on a line in their cover two allotment. You can almost go right up that 40-yard line and they're almost shoulder to shoulder as far as in their exact setup, as well as the outside cornerbacks have dropped into their bail technique. Now, it doesn't look pretty on this play, does it? You've got at least three Atlanta Falcon wide receivers that are wide open. As well as you also notice on this play that on top of Matt Ryan having a clean pocket, you're going to also notice one of the other main reasons for why this defense has failed over the last couple of years. Ryan not only has a clean pocket, he has passing lanes, he is well set up in the pocket, so this play has had some time to develop, and yet not one of the pass rushers of the Seattle Seahawks is giving him any bit of the slightest concern. This has been one of the main problems. If you're going to run the Tampa 2 defense, you better have a Warren Sapp. You better have a Simeon Rice. If you're going to run the Seahawks cover three defense, you better have a Michael Bennett paired with a Cliff Averill, paired with a Chris Clemens. That's what you're going to need. Seahawks didn't have anything close to that on either end of those scales. So when they weren't trying to ask Jamal Adams to blitz at a career high rate, they were then asking him to also play into a cover two or cover one responsibility. And let's just say... That didn't go particularly well. All right, Jamal, Julian Edelman's going deep. Get deep, get deep, get deep. <sighs> All right, Cooper Cup's going deep on you. Get on your horse. Let's go, let's go. Locate the ball. Find the ball. Find the ball. Oh, hell. All right, Deshaun Jackson, he's still got those old man wheels. Get on, get on, get going, get going. Look back, locate the ball. Look, don't do that. Jamal Adams just isn't a cover two or cover one safety. You can occasionally, oh, so occasionally, ask him to do that responsibility. But where he does his best work is going forward, attacking, being a predator type of player. This is how he was once great before, not just merely good, but great. And though he's not good in those zone responsibilities, he's actually a little bit unheralded as it concerns his ability and coverage against running backs and tight ends. Even this past season, when matched up against George Kittle, he did a very good job. It's just that he's put been put continuously out of position. And this is one of the main reasons that Ken Norton is now out of a job. Now we come to this offseason. 
Coach Carroll has once again fired his defensive coordinator and once again elevated a positional coach to take over those duties. So is he merely rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic here, doing the same thing that he tried once before that didn't work? No. Enter the Sith metaphor from Star Wars that I made at the beginning of this show. For the Seattle Seahawks are seeking their defensive fix in the dark ways of the enemy. They hired this offseason Sean Desai to be an assistant head coach. He's the former defensive coordinator for the Chicago Bears last season. But more importantly, he learned at the knee of one defensive maestro, Vic Fangio, the cover two shell defense. And the reason I say that this is the ways of the enemy that we are utilizing is because Vic Fangio, of course, was the defensive coordinator for the 49ers during Harbaugh's time there in the 2010s and onward. He also was the man who trained Brandon Staley, the man whose defenses, though it was a short period of time, gave our Hawk offense quite a few troubles, gave Russell Wilson quite a few troubles, which, of course, is part of the reason that helped elevate him into being a head coach with the Chargers despite being so young and new into the NFL. So we are taking on the ways of the enemy here. And quite frankly, this has been long in the coming because beyond taking on the ways of the enemy, you are doing changes into the secondary that are absolutely necessary in this modern age, much like pre-snap motion is becoming a necessity on the offensive side of the ball. But don't take my word for it. Listen to what Coach Carroll had to say about it during the combine interviews. We, we feel like we need to do everything. To, to, you know, we need to use our, our single high stuff and our, and our two high stuff to mix that and do a really nice job of that. And uh, Sean and, and Carl both bring um, a, a, wide, a wide breadth of, of experience to help us with our looks and disguises and, and to make it as intricate as we can and as difficult as we can on the quarterback. We have been a little bit, I'll tell you, we've been a little bit uh, arrogant over the years, the way we play defense, because we've been able to do it just and go ahead and play what we want to play. It's, it's not, it's not uh, that time right now. It's, it's time to keep moving and keep growing. And uh, we've played the running game so well. I mean, we like three, eight, you know, a carry, you know, for the season, that's pretty darn good, you know, in this league. And, and uh, maybe that's not the only thing we need to do. Well, you know, we can do some other things too. What does Sean Desai and new defensive passing coordinator, Carl Scott, bring to the table? First, there will be a major shift to a 3-4 defense away from the 4-3. Seattle will still run the 4-3 from time to time, that amount depending on the type of opponent they're playing. What's interesting about this brand of 3-4 is it places the defensive ends in an odd 4-I technique, meaning inside the tackles, inside shoulder, as opposed to heads up across from them. But we'll get to that part in a second. The key the Fangio's defense is the defensive backfield and the cover two shell it's built upon. Now you might be saying, but Brandon, you said the cover two was bad. Why is this any better? Because you're merely showing the offense a cover two look when post snap, the coverage will usually be something quite different and often varied. The Seattle Seahawks have been the most predictable defense over the last half decade of the NFL. It was their rudimentary blitz game, simplified coverages, but also a lack of disguising their intentions that have caused the recent struggles. At one point, deep into the season last year, the Seahawks were showing a coverage look that was 94% of the time what they ran post-snap. If they showed you cover two pre-snap, you got it post-snap. If they showed you cover three pre-snap, cover three was a coming. The Fangio style of defense flips the script. They show you the shell of a cover two defense and then become something else entirely post-snap. This debilitates a quarterback's pre-snap reads and ultimately creates confusion. The fun doesn't stop there. The defense can also morph from a 3-4 to a 3-3-5. In these moments, you replace a defensive lineman for a defensive back in order to help the back end of coverage against these high volume passing attacks, specifically an extra guy for those dodgy flood zone concepts. In 2020, the Broncos defense showed a light box on a whopping 78% of their defensive snaps, while the Rams were at 77%. Both teams this particular season had a 38% positive play rate allowed on run plays against a light box. To put this in perspective, 19 teams in this particular NFL season had a worse positive play rate allowed on runs using a stacked box, which is eight or more defenders. 
The 335 also facilitates a better way to get Jamal Adams out of coverage hell. He can play more of a rover-like role that puts him somewhere between a linebacker and a safety. Blitzing becomes easier than from a 4-3. Essentially, this defense will fit to Jamal Adams' game rather than the Seahawks misusing Adams in the prior stifling defense. Let's go back to the defensive ends and their inside alignment opposite the offensive tackles in this new scheme. Instead of two-gapping like the Seahawks did before from their 4-3, you will now see the linemen play what's called a gap-and-a-half technique. Shoot a gap under control as you need to be ready to get to your backside gap if the play goes that way. Make no mistake about it, folks. This is a downhill, engulfing type of defense. The cover two shell defense changes the whole bloody game. The frustrating predictability of prior Hawk defenses, both pre and post snap, now instantly becomes the opposite. The defensive lineman's former passive two gapping ways now becomes attacking. And blitzing, whoo! The door to blitzing opens like barn doors. No, you're not dreaming. You're just looking at the solution. My name is Brandon Kane. Thank you for watching. Please hit the like button. Please subscribe. But, but beyond all that, don't you ever forget, go Hawks. No more half measures.